Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining in today's SOFOS uh, Spotlight webinar. And today's topic is the NIS or NIS 2 directive and understanding how this affects compliance, cybersecurity compliance in your region. Uh, we are joined by former director at the National Cybersecurity Center, John Noble, and also SOFOS senior technology evangelist, Jonathan Hope. Both our presenters will bring in some expert insights on what this regulation means and how to stay compliant. During the presentation, if you have any questions, you can feel free to add these questions into the Q&A panel. Our experts are online and they will try to answer these questions in writing, or we'll also try to take up some questions live after the presentation. Uh, with that, over to you, John Noble. Well, thank you very much indeed for that introduction, and thank you to Sophos for allowing me to be part of this um, event. NIST 2 directive is really important and the legislation that will flow from it will impact many, many organizations across Europe. So it's tremendous to be part of this event. Before I, I really begin, I want to make a, um, give a couple of caveats. The first is that much of the directive is focused on the responsibility of states. I'm not intending to cover that today. Instead, we'll be focusing on what it means for organizations, whether in the private or public sector. And the other caveat is really to say, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I spent quite a lot of time reading through the directive, talking to people involved in its production um, and reading some of the research papers. And you can take, because it's a directive, you can take different views. I really would recommend that um, if you think you are going to be impacted, that you take some time with your general counsel, with your legal team, to go through the directive to understand exactly what it means for you. So what would I like to, um, what am I not planning to cover? John, if you could take us to the next slide, please. My, my agenda for today is I'm really intending to, to begin by going through the context, explaining why this directive is happening. I want to talk about the purpose of the directive and explain some of the key measures that will be within the legislation when it's eventually enacted, which is being driven by the directive. For those of you who are within the UK or doing business with the, with the UK or might be impacted by UK in this legislation, I'll talk a bit about some of the changes there. Um, but perhaps most importantly, I want to talk about the impact from these changes, um, what's being proposed by the NIST 2 directive and the actions that need to be taken. And then finally, I'll hand over to John and John's going to talk you through how SOFOS can help and we're going between us we're going to go and run through some of the conclusions what we do um, so what i'm going to do now is if we move to the next slide is i'm going to give you a little bit of the context and really i think there's two parts to the context the first is to understand where this directive fits amongst some of the key european union cybersecurity initiatives um, and really, they started back in March 2004 with the, the establishment of the European Union Agency for Network and Information Security, ENISA, um, and its founding. But perhaps arguably the most important um, move forward was the, the publication of the original NIST directive in December 2015. And that set out guidelines on how member states should improve their cybersecurity. And that became EU law um, on March 2016, with a deadline of May 2018 for EU countries to have adopted the, the, the directive into their de domestic legislation. I think it's fair to say that not all organisations, I'm sorry, not all countries managed that, but eventually everybody did. And say a really important step forward for cybersecurity initiatives within the. Um, EU. And at the same time, of course, we had the publication uh, legislation for GDPR, which of course also um, affects all of us, which also came in May 2018. In the case of the UK, um, we also introduced the um, um, NIST regulation to law in May 2018. Um, and more recently, there has been a review published on um, the UK's NIST, NIST regulations and revisions, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And that brings us to NIST 2. 
So in January of this year, um, we we published the um, uh, the direct NIST two directive with a deadline of it being coming law by October 24. That's when EU member states should have put it into their own legislation. So that's a bit about the the context. And now I want to go and move on to the next slide and talk about some of the the threat context because that's been a key factor in why NIS2 directive has been issued. And the first point is that clearly because of COVID and the, the impact that it had, you know, we are all much more reliant on our digital infrastructure. Um, and it, digitalization has become far more important for everyone, whether they're individuals or whether they are companies, even companies that perhaps haven't traditionally thought themselves as being digital ones. At the same time, We've seen a dramatic increase in number of cyber attacks, particularly those which are linked to ransomware. And we've seen, you know, basically, as as, as one uh, politician who's supporting this directive, one EU politician said, you know, the the attacks against EU countries are now on industrial uh, industrial scale. And certainly, that's what the groups that you're facing now. You know, they are working. It's part of a very big. Um, a business, which is you know, many hundreds of millions of euros. What we're also seeing, and you know, it's very much a theme in the, in the directive, <clears throat> we're seeing some very significant supply chain attacks, um, um, significant in the impact that they're they're, they're having. And this really has brought home how we are reliant in, on a connect world on our supply chain, and we need to be thinking about that. So again, we'll cover that as we go through. Another factor you know, is that of the um, Russian invasion of Ukraine in February last year. Um, and that has highlighted the, uh, the threat that everybody um, faces um, and has really highlighted the need for action at a state level. And the final point that I'll make is not really one of threat, but it's it's one about which has been it's a clear factor which driving those who produced the directive is that whilst the original NIST directive improved coherence and improved standards of cybersecurity and resilience, it wasn't enough, and standards still vary greatly across the EU, and there is to a certain extent still an inconsistent view across the EU on the cyber threat. So that's what the directive is designed to address. So let's move on now and look at what the objectives are, what the purpose of NIST 2 is. I think this is really important because you know, when we think about you know, directives and legislation, we often quite rightly focus on you know, the potential fines, but really we've got to go back to what do the people who produce this want? And the first point is that the EU wants to make sure that its citizens and its economies are protected from the growing risk of online threats. Therefore, the purpose of the directive, this two directive, is, is to build on the, the requirements of the original directive, and um, but with the intention remaining to protect critical infrastructure and organisations within the EU from cyber attacks and achieve an improved level of common security across the European Union. Okay, let's go through now. So what are the key measures within within this two? Um, well, it requires member states to take a number of additional measures. And I'm gonna cover each of these four areas in turn. So the first one is to have increased cyber resilience across essential service providers. The second area is strengthen cyber security standards and, and, and penalties to improve resilience. Thirdly, enhance capacity to anticipate and respond to cyber attacks. And finally, EU-wide incident response. So we're going to look at each of these um, in turn. And let's begin with increased cyber resilience across the service providers. The objective being to ensure that all essential service providers are protected from cyber threats. And therefore, they must comply with the, the NIST 2 directive. And the scope of organizations that we're going to see is far greater. So the definition of what is essential you know, has, has been extended. 
Um, it's not just that the scope of the revised direct changed in several ways, and I'm going to go and highlight those now. So we'll move on to the, the next slide. So the first point is that more industrial sectors are covered, and I'm going to cover that shortly. In effect, there are two categories of entity, essential and important. Their, their categorization depends on whether they work within a critical or a very critical sector, and these will be, be covered. <clears throat> now, I mentioned earlier the importance of supply chain. Well, the key piece is that organizations that are subcontractors and service providers who deliver support are specifically covered. Now, there are some exemptions based on size you know, for smaller organizations generally are not, um, are not caught within the directive. However, where an entity, where a company is the sole provider in a member state of a service which is deemed critical, and where disruption of the service provided would have a significant impact, it can still be covered by the directive and the resulting legislation. NIS2 is expected to apply, therefore, to a broad range of businesses which provide the services or carry out their activities in the EU, even if they are not based in a member state. I think that's maybe something people have not fully grasped. So you don't have to be um, based in the EU, but if you're providing services within it, then you can be covered, you will be um, covered by the directive and the resulting legislation. Okay, let's look next on the next slide at the, um, the changes to the NIST2 industry sectors. So under the original NIST directive, um, and they're shown in uh, here on the left-hand side, the health sector, digital infrastructure, transport, water supply, digital service providers, financial markets and banking and energy were all sectors which were covered um, and deemed to be highly critical. The additional sectors now covered within this two include wastewater, healthcare supply chain, postal and courier services, aerospace, public administration. Though I think it's I want to emphasize at this point that some activity that's carried out by um, nation states, for example, around national security, those are exempted from the legislation, but other parts, aspects of public administration will be covered. Um, it also covers the providers of public electronic communications, digital providers, infrastructure, ICT and management, so much wider scope on the digital side. And the critical entities, research, food supply chain, and critical manufacturers, for example, I've put some down here, vehicles, chemical, medical, and electronics. So a lot of uh, manufacturers will be um, caught up within, within those, those areas. We'll return to this slide a little bit later when I uh, give you another chance to, to look at this. Okay, let's move on and look at the cybersecurity standards and penalties to improve resilience. How is this going, going to be done and why, why is it changing? Well, the original directive gave organizations some flexibility in how they complied with the regulations. However, as a result of this flexibility, some organizations did not take the necessary measures to, to protect themselves and their customers from cyber threats. So the directive is designed to close some of those loopholes. The directive also strengthens the security requirements and introduces penalties for organizations to not comply with the directive. The intention here is to have harmonized enforcement and sanctions across the EU. Now, much of the relevant detail on what's required of organizations is contained in Article 21 of the directive. And that is one bit I really would encourage you to look at. And we'll have a quick look at my summary now on the next slide. So Article 21 um, details some of the measures that are needed. And um, I think these are some of the most, most important ones. So firstly, really what I think we would all describe as, as basic cyber hygiene, covering those baseline practices such as password management, the protection of systems administrators, software updates, the importance of having backups. So that's the first area which is you know, highlighted within Article 21. 
specific mention is made of vulnerability management and the importance of supply chain security. There is also reference to encryption and cryptography um, standards and asset management. One of the areas highlighted for importance is access control and zero trust security. It also requires that organizations have gone through a risk analysis process so that they can identify the measures that they need to be taken. And this is a really important part of what you will need to do. Um, finally, there are um, there's reference around incident handling and reporting. We'll talk a little bit more about those later. And the importance of business continuity, the, the, the ability to include crisis management and disaster recovery. Now, I want to make one point about this, some of these Article 21. We can expect these to be, I think, further revised as the, as, as the directive goes forward. And of course, nation states may seek to add additional um, um, cyber security standards on top of um, these. But as you can see, I think they are pretty comprehensive and they re represent a major step forward. OK, let's go and move on now. So the next aspect is, is, is around the um, um, compliance with this. So sanctions include the need to respond to orders arising from implementation of a security order <coughs> that measures compliance with, this to, with, with the directive. Now it's been estimated that companies currently covered by the directive will need to increase their budgets by up to 12%. Those are, in other words, who are already covered by the original NIST directive to comply with NIST 2, they could need a, um, a, um, an additional 12%. 12%. And those who, who are newly covered, the estimate is up to 22%. However, I think it's important to emphasize that it's recognized within the directive that the costs need to be proportionate. You, but you need to have gone through that process to show that you can justify where you have or have not increased your spend in order to do compliance. And sanctions can include administrative fines of up to 10 million euros or 2% of the organization's worldwide turnover. And I think arguably some of the most important changes are that senior management of critical entities can be held personally liable. So those who sit on boards in executive positions can be held personally liable. And I think this is something in our briefing within organizations we've really got to emphasize. And we'll, we'll come on to that when we talk about what we need to go and do. Okay, let's move on now. So the next area is how do we, you know, enhance capacity to anticipate and respond to attacks? How how is this planned? Well, there are a number of things which which are talked about at the sort of nation state level. However, the directive specifically recognised in order to be able to improve the response, there needs to be improved coordination and communication. And it gives the details of how it should be done. And it emphasised that this both between member states, the different member states and between different governments, but also between them and their public and private sector. And we'll expect to see the details of how um, different nation states will do that when they produce their own national legislation. But very much the emphasis is on streamlined and timely reporting. Okay, next slide, please. So, one of the key objectives is to have improved EU-wide incident response, recognizing that often um, an attack can be across the sector, it doesn't recognize national um, um, boundaries. Now, within the original directive, organizations were only required to report incidents that had a significant impact on their operations. Now, as a result of this discretionary um, element, many organizations fail to report incidents. Under NIST 2, however, there is compulsory reporting of cyber incidents regardless of the impact. The objective of this change is to ensure that the relevant national authorities can track the different threats. Um, there are mandatory requirements for the timing of the reporting of incidents to the relevant National Centre for Cybersecurity, and, and the establishment of the CSERTs is one of the key parts requirements on nation states. And significant incidents must be reported within 24 hours with further timings for follow-up update reports. 
say there's a requirement on states to have an, an incident response plan and to have established a national cyber uh, cybersecurity incident response team. Okay, let's move on. I want to just briefly mention some of the EU, sorry, the UK um, this regulation changes for those of you say who are who are doing business within the EU or are based with the UK or based in, in the UK. So proposals to update the UK's NIST regulations um, and with the purpose of improving cyber resilience were announced in December um, last year. Um, and the key points are it's bringing managed service providers into scope of the regulations to keep digital supply chain secure, very much in the way that NIST 2 will do. Improving cyber incident reporting to regulators establishing a cost recovery system for enforcing the NIST regulations and giving the, the government the power to amend future regulations without needing to go to Parliament to make sure that they can remain timely and effective and enabling the Information Commissioner to take a more risk-based approach to regulating digital services. Now these are not as comprehensive as wide-ranging as NIST 2. However, very much talking to, to colleagues in uh, UK government, we can expect further changes as the plans for the legislation are being, being developed. Okay, next slide. So what's it all mean? Well, in summary, more organizations will be covered and will require to comply with the, the NIST 2 directive and the, and the resulting legislation. These organizations will need to introduce new cybersecurity systems and practice, and this could have significant financial implications. Organizations already covered by NIST may need, still need to adjust their cybersecurity posture to comply with the new mandatory and enhanced standards. Again, there's going to be a financial implications. Okay, next. So what do you need to do? First, I think you've got to understand, are you an essential or an important entity under NIST 2? So, and these, you're going to ask the question, are you a public or private entity? Do you operate in a critical or a very critical sector? Do you provide services or conduct activities within the EU? And are you a medium-sized enterprise employing 50 people or more and have an annual turnover of more than 10 um, um, million euros? If that's the case, then this two directive will um, apply to you. However, as I said earlier, if you operate in a very critical, critical sector and meet some of these national risk assessments um, criteria, um, one example is providing domain name registration services, you could still be impacted, you, sorry, you still could be covered regardless of your site. So it's very important that you go through this to make sure that you are covered. Okay, next one, please. So just to remind you what those changes are to the different sectors and the new areas, so I'm not going to go through them again, but I just want you to be able to go and see um, what, what is there. Okay, next slide, please. So what do you need to do? What I think are the key actions. So I think you need to understand which member states or states have jurisdiction over your business for these two purposes. And you've got to identify what cybersecurity risk management processes you therefore need to put place in place and comply. Because to say there could be additional ones added to this. You need to identify and assess and address your cyber risks. And really, this takes us back to the purpose of legislation. This is what it's designed to do when it comes through. The directive wants us to improve our standards, so we've got to go through this process. You should work through the measures set out in Article 21 and map them against an appropriate security framework. I've given ISO 27001 because um, uh, it's clearly very widely used um, and I think it fits quite well. But you should use whatever security um, framework um, you think is right and we'll come on to a bit more about that later. You should focus on your supply chain risks, particularly around software. And you really got, having gone through this process, understand how much it will cost to take the appropriate and proportionate technical operation organization measures to manage the risk. And I've directly quoted that from the directive. You should formalize an incident 
response plan and understand the reporting requirements to the relevant national authorities. And finally, and I think this is really important when it comes back down to the senior management um, responsibility, get a formal high-level management sign-off. So go through this process and be able to demonstrate that you've, you know, you've attempted compliance um, and where, you, where the decisions have been being made. So I think at that point, I will pause and I'm going to go and hand over to John, who's going to talk about how SOFAS can help. Over to you, John. Fab. Thank you very much indeed, John, for that, that overview. I've, I've certainly learned a few things there this morning, and I hope our audience will have done so as well. Um, just a quick reminder as well, um, we do have the option for you to leave any questions that you might want to answer by myself and John at the end of the session. So just use the uh, the chat dialog box uh, on your screen. Um, so yeah, moving on from, from John's excellent overview there, let's take a look now at the Sophos uh, portfolio of products and services and just have a little look in, in some more detail at how we can help you meet your compliance requirements. Um, now, fortunately, quite a lot of the heavy lifting work has already been done for me. So there is a freely available white paper on the Sophos website which you can access uh, using the QR code that I've conveniently placed in the top right hand corner of the next couple of slides for you. Um, so by following the link on there, you can download this white paper and it goes through a lot of detail about our stance on the NIST2 directive and also takes a look at our range of products and services and maps those against the directive requirements and explains in a little bit of detail there exactly how we can help. So all of the really, really important information about how we can help out is included in that white paper so I would highly encourage you to take that away and uh, read through that in a little bit more detail and um, as John has um, very eloquently put there there is a lot of elements of the NIST 2 directive and of course there is a large number of industries and sectors that it applies to so the answer to the question of how we can help is, is not a straightforward one and doesn't really reference one individual product or service. And of course, because it is a combination of people, uh, process and technology, um, there's a lot of different product areas that, uh, that we can offer that will help your organization. I will take you through some of those and I'm going to look at it in a slightly different way to the white paper. Instead of looking at it from a product st stack perspective, I'm going to look at it in those three elements there of people, process and technology. And we'll start out with the people section. Um, for those of you who've seen some of my uh, broadcasts on um, online before, you'll know that I'm very passionate about um, education of users. And this is one area that is certainly called out in the, uh, the NIST2 directive there about education and making people um, empowered so that they can spot what is likely to be a, a cyber risk or a threat and then responding accordingly. Now, within our portfolio, we do have a product called Fish Threat, which is a uh, phishing simulation tool. It allows you to uh, simulate phishing attacks against your own user base so that you can measure your cyber readiness and also drive their knowledge of recognizing not just phishing attacks actually but actually general cyber security awareness can be driven using the fish threat platform and um, for those of you that are um, Sophos customers already um, you will find fish threat within Sophos Central so it's a really nice augmentation if you're using Sophos Central to manage some of your cyber security estate already so that helps enormously with the aspects associated with training and education uh, for this directive. Um, then if we move on to the process sides of things, then um, John did mention it in, in some detail around the processes associated with identifying risk and then also how to handle an incident. And of course, this is really where we should be talking uh, in some detail at Sophos about um, two services that we offer. Um, so the first of which is our incident response service. This is a service which is available um, not just to existing Sophos customers, but also to other organizations that have experienced some kind of cyber breach. And and the incident response service allows our experts at Sophos, our dedicated team of incident responders, to be able to work with an unfortunate organization in these set of circumstances so that we can compile important information such as, you know, what is the nature of the attack, limiting the attack, obviously, if it's still in progress, but then also carrying out some forensic activity there to understand the severity of the impact and uh, understanding the root cause um, that is likely to have triggered the event. And this is, of course, is 
important for two reasons. One, from a compliance perspective in terms of notification of um, the relevant authorities and exactly what incident occurred, how it occurred, why it occurred. But also, of course, there's an important lesson to be learned in any of these kind of cyber breaches. So taking the knowledge that we can glean from our incident response team and then using that to make sure that we don't become a victim of some kind of similar situation in the future. So that will certainly assist from the, the, the process perspective of incident response and our managed detection and response service. In many cases, if you uh, if you opt for our MDR complete package, will also not just include proactive threat hunting, but then also include incident response if, again, the worst does happen and an organization does become the victim of some kind of breach. So in both cases, assisting the organization to how and how to report on these issues and how to make sure they don't become a victim of an issue again moving forward. And then when it comes to the technology aspect, this is where um, there is no real single answer within our portfolio. Um, but of course, as soon as you start talking about technology from the point of view of um, basic cyber hygiene, of course, we offer things like endpoint protection, server protection, uh, our firewall products. Um, and if you look down the line at things like our supply chain capabilities, then again, using our managed detection response service, we can be uh, monitoring activity uh, both inside the estate and uh, activity coming in from externally um, to monitor and uh, to alert organizations if uh, they are in the process of becoming a victim of some kind of cyber incident. Of course, our network um, services also include the ability to um, detect uh, activities at network level, including um, our uh, NDR product as well as our firewall product. And again, we've talked a little bit about the procedures associated with risk management as well. So being able to highlight devices that are unprotected, uh, highlighting devices that maybe require updates and that kind of thing. So using the technology stack that we have right across the portfolio, again, to make sure that organizations are uh, in the best possible place when it comes to being protected against the uh, ongoing attacks and issues that we see. Now, I did say that there was no one single answer to uh, to these challenges, and that's absolutely true. But if I've got just a couple of moments to talk about one um, product or service area specifically that helps out, then I would definitely be talking about our managed detection and response service. The reason that we are so passionate about our MDR service is that in many cases, we believe that cybersecurity has become a challenge, which is too great for most organizations in-house to be able to deal with effectively. Um, the game has moved on significantly from technology being the only solution to these kind of cyber challenges. And now we very much advocate the approach of offering um, not just technology, but also operating a team of dedicated cybersecurity experts that can detect and respond to uh, incidents and issues that technology on its own would simply be unable to prevent. So the kind of attacks that often fly under the radar or are not necessarily out and out malware, but activities that are detrimental to the organization. And of course, many large organizations may well operate some kind of security center but if they're not operating 24 hours a day seven days a week 365 days a year then there are always gaps that we can offer to cover uh, and assist organizations in this level of proactive monitoring and it's great to know as well that we don't only take telemetry and information into our MDR desk from our own range of products but we do have a very wide range of third-party integrations as well so if you happen to be an organization which is not currently consuming pro uh, Sophos product, then in many cases, we can take the telemetry from your existing cybersecurity investments and roll that into our team so that we do get the important information from those products so that we can act accordingly. This is a fantastic way of um, unlocking the very best return on investment from the cybersecurity investments that you've already made. Because if you have any of the products that are on the screen here or the, the more exhaustive list that we have, um, then if you're not monitoring the alerts and telemetry coming from those products, you probably aren't realistically getting the best out of those. So having our team being able to monitor the alerts and, uh, and notify you or act on your behalf in many cases, if that's what you wish, you are unlocking the, the very best capabilities uh, from the security investments that you've made. Essentially, if you have a bunch of tools that you already have, the great news is if you're interested in the managed detection response service, you don't necessarily have to replace those. And as I said, in many cases, we can long, work alongside the existing investments that you've already made. 
Now, in both cases, what we do at a very high level is take the information from um, those various different sensors, your endpoint protection, your network estate, your firewall, so on and so forth. And we, um, we take all of those through an, an important process where we correlate interesting events together, normalize, and ultimately try to get the information in front of the human analyst as fast as we possibly can, because we need that human with their human intuition and expertise to be able to look at that incident as quickly as possible. Now, in many cases, it takes just one minute to go from an interesting uh, or suspicious event moving through to actually creating an investigation and uh, once our analysts start investigating on average it takes about 25 minutes to investigate an issue work out if it's real if it is real what is the scope of the problem and how can we best deal with that challenge and then if you would like us to remediate on your behalf so remediation would include things like isolating infected machines and um, shutting down malicious processes um, highlighting and uh, disabling uh, malicious and fraudulent accounts for example then we can do that typically in around about 12 minutes so this is a mean time to respond when you add those those numbers together of just 38 minutes which is incredibly quick and in, in many cases faster than internal security teams can offer so of course one of the best ways of not falling foul of many of the um, more um, toothy aspects of the um, uh, the NIST regulations is to actually make sure that you don't become a victim in the first place and this is a great way of stopping any suspicious activity be before it becomes a real cyber event um, so there's just a bit of an overview on um, where you can get resources from and how some of the Sophos products and services uh, can assist you. Um, at this point, I am going to welcome John back into the fray um, so that between this, we can go through the conclusions from this webinar before we open the floor up for questions and answers. Thanks, John. So I think the first point I'll make is NIST 2 is recognition that the scale of the threat um, and the importance of, of, of cybersecurity, it, you know, it's, it, it really does show that people understand that there's a significant threat. And the work, all the people listening to this 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 webinar um, do is so important. The implementation is going to pose both compliance and cyber cybersecurity challenges. This this is about the whole of the organisation involved in this work coming together to address it. But I think it is an opportunity. Um, yes, you know, there, there are, but it is an opportunity for those who are cybersecurity professionals, information governance professionals, to address some of the key things that you really worry about the cybersecurity things. Um, I do think it's really important we go back to that key objective directive, which is around improving our cybersecurity, and that is critically important. Yeah, absolutely. I would entirely echo that. It's a great reset point to review your existing estate and review the spending and how you're making that spending to make sure that you're doing all the right things that you need to do. So it's a real line in the sand and a real opportunity to uh, to review what you're doing. Um, my conclusions would certainly be as well that do bear in mind that we have a, a bunch of um, freely available resources, not just the white paper that discusses the, um, the NIST 2 um, um, regulations, but also things like our incident response planning guides. There's a whole bunch of really Really good resources available on the Sophos website and again they're all there free of charge um, so if you do have a Sophos account manager feel free to reach out or it's uh, simply a search engine away from finding those really really good resources and of course as well as the free resources that we have we do have a really wide range of products and services that can help you to succeed and, and help you remain compliant with uh, the new regulations as they unfold. Um, so with all of those things said, John, unless you've got anything to answer, I think we'll uh, add rather, I think we'll go to the section of, of, of Q&A. Yeah, no, that'd be good. Fab, right, so if you haven't already asked your question, then do feel free to type out the question in the dialog box on the right hand side of your screen typically, and we'll get to those as we go through. But let's just take a little peek now and see um what questions we have in here okay so there's a couple of questions um and i, I should frame this as well just to re-emphasize john's original statement we aren't lawyers and you should always uh, consult uh, for, for legal advice but one of the questions here is looking at organizations and um whether they fall under the category of, of this two or not the question is is it 50 employees and 10 million euro turnover or is it an either or scenario so john that is definitely a question for you 
So yeah, as I put in a sort of chat, I think it's it's an all quite right. Robert, you know, flagged up that um, I think it could be it, you can be covered if 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 you've got ten million or if you've got fifty. That's what I believe. I think it's probably well worth checking, getting a lawyer to go and to to go through that. I think the other point is that that could again change as nation states enact it. People could decide that's too low to or they could in, they could reduce. They can't um, they can't make it more difficult, but um, the, the key and, and the other point really to emphasize here is if you're a quick supplier to somewhere where you'd have you know, your impact on you or on the organization of the country that you're supporting would be enormous, then regardless of the size, you are you are covered. So something well worth going through, but I, Robert's right in his question. I think it's an all. Fantastic. Thank you for the clarification on that. Um, so there's a functional one here about is the webinar going to be recorded? Will you get linked to this later? The answer to that question is yes. Um, so another question for you, John. I'm afraid you're in the firing line again. Um, does EU DORA affect NIS2 requirements? So it's a really good question from Clive, um, and it sort of highlights in you know, a wider bit. So, so what is DORA for those of you who who don't you know go through EU? Um, proposals every day, the Digital Operational Resilience Act. Um, and it is just about that. And so it basically complements um, what NIST 2 is being doing, right? you know, providing more detail. Um, there's a whole host of other initiatives which are out there, which I haven't covered today, because you know, we wanted to focus on NIST 2. Um, and that's why I provided that context slide at the beginning. We could have added a whole host of, of, of other um, directors, ones which are covering um, around the standards that you, sh you, you should be um, um, doing for software. There's a lot of stuff which is out there, and this is going to continue to build. So yes, you've got to, and um, DORA will apply if you're um, your special um, um, operational and resilience, um, and it's definitely well worth staying in touch with that. Maybe John will want to do another webinar on all, all of the other things which are changing. And I think it's great that the EU has really focused on this and, and is devoting so much of the future legislative time to this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I think we covered this. So just a very brief word on the UK, if. Um, uh, just, just to re-emphasise, John, if if you would be so kind. So the question is, will the UK have to comply as well? So you know, we get into some horrible Brexit um, politics, here, don't we? But but I'm going to try and avoid that and say the UK doesn't have to com comply. Um, what the EU is doing, DCMS, which is the, which is the government department which is doing that, is trying to ensure that. We don't have lower standards. We um, make it as easy as possible for companies to be, work across. So I think you know we will, and, and just to do, that it's got the same objective as the EU legislators, which is to improve the standard of cyber security within the UK. So it doesn't have to comply, but it feels as though, based on what we've seen so far, is that the U, um, the the UK's NIS. Um, uh, legislation will, the new one, will look very much like um, this too. Does that Fab. make sense? It, it, it does make perfect sense. Thank you. Yeah, there's a few questions that have come up as well on the supply chain side of things. So if I summarise all of those questions, it's essentially, first and foremost, how do you determine if you are uh, in scope in terms of being a critical entity? And does this apply to the uh, supply chain of those organisations as well? And I, I'm not sure that everybody knows the answers to that. And I think some of this has still got to be um, worked through. You know, if you're if you're a supplier and then you're your own, I think you've got to work on the worst case, but you've got to go and talk talk this through um, and decide. You know, at what point if you're a supplier to a supplier to a supplier, we clearly get on to um, craziness. But I think you, if if you are covered by this too, you have got to think about your supply chain. And I think that's why it's going to eventually it's going to go and impact so many different organisations who are working, uh, who are in the U or working with it. I think it's going to be covered an awful lot. 
Fantastic, thank you. Now, there's a couple of questions for me here. You'll be glad to know, so I'll um, I'll give you a little bit of breathing room. Um, so there's a couple of questions around the MDR service that I've just talked about and looking at the the pricing structure associated with that. So I'm um, not going to be able to answer that um, because there's not sort of full information on the organization size but essentially just like all of our um, products um, the way that MDR is licensed is based on a per seat basis um, so once we know the organization size then we can we can obviously calculate a price for you accordingly and uh, obviously that cost per seat does reduce as the organization gets bigger um, so that's a definitely a conversation David to have with your Sophos account manager and there was another question as well is um, around um, investigating alerts from non sophos products um so i did talk about some of the integrations that we have there as well there was a very specific question here around industrial control systems and that's where our ndr product comes into play so we have a network and uh, detection and response uh, product which will monitor telemetry that's going across your estate from the kind of uh, platforms that aren't necessarily able to have an endpoint agent on them so industrial control has been just one example and the telemetry from those sensors can be sent to our MDR team for investigation in the same way as alerts from, from other either native or non-native uh, Sophos endpoints, for example. So we can cover those industrial control systems as well um, through a, a combination of those two different solutions that we've talked about. Um, there was another question around um, uh, Sophos Central being used as a SIEM. Um, we don't necessarily meet all of the requirements of a SIEM, um, but um, what we are very much focused on is collating the important alerts and events from a security perspective. So depending on the level of data that the organization does actually need to retain, we may be able to help in some cases. But if you're looking for kind of information on sort of how uh, users are individually logging in, how long they're spending online, what they're doing, that kind of thing, then we may not necessarily see all of those alerts. Um, so again, conversation to have with a sales engineer at Sophos, I would suggest let's understand what your requirements are, why you think you need to see, and let's have a look as to, to whether our platform is uh, capable of meeting those demands or whether you would still need to go out and, and, and purchase a dedicated SIEM on top of your security solutions as well. Um, we've just got one more that's just arrived in. Um, so this is back to you, actually, John. Um, so um, the question is, do the sanctions scale with organization and company size or are those sanctions that you've mentioned there a static uh, number? I think I think the ones that I, I mentioned were based on either percentage or up to. I think there will be it would obviously depend on the appropriate regulatory authority to decide. Um, but, that, but that's what they are being given as their guide on what it should be like, and it does. It is either on a percentage of turnover, which clearly would be on 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 the size, or up to the the, the 10 million. Um, I think that um, you know what we've 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 seen this already, haven't we, with GDPR, the way that different regulators have decided to 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 go about that, and I'm sure that we will see it. But yes, in in theory, a large organisation could um, face a much bigger much bigger um, um, financial impact. I should say there's been some fantastic questions here, John. I hope we can get back to people on some of these because there's been some really, really good questions here. Yeah. There is one, I'm, I'm, we're going to have to draw a line under this at some point, but this is a really good one which has just come in as well. It's definitely worth a little look at. So if my specific country is too slow to implement the NIS in local legislation, do the requirements still come into place on October 2024 or not? Well, I'm definitely. In, um, it will be done. And it is. If we go on the original NIST directive, not everybody made it, but it was. It was up to different um, countries when to get it get it in place. I can't remember what how they they intend to make it um, more. What's the button, right word we're looking for? Um, to to force countries to make sure that they meet that um, um, deadline. But I think you've got to plan on the basis that you're going to be covered by October 2024. You know, if, if a country, for whatever reason, parliamentary pressures or whatever it might be is slower, so be it. But I think you should plan on everybody being covered by October 24. I think that's wise. I think working to a deadline, even if it, that deadline slips, is is definitely good practice. As we've we've seen through this presentation, there are a lot of aspects to consider, a lot of things that need to be covered. So I think working towards that deadline is is wise, and and certainly not leaving things to the last minute would be a good course of action as well. Um, so John, I want to thank you very much indeed um, for your input, um, both during the presentation and during the Q and A session as well. Thank you very much indeed. It was very very insightful. And um, to audience, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it 
useful. A copy of this webinar will be available for you to download very, very shortly. And of course, do remember those uh, those excellent resources on the SOFOS website. But for now, we'll bring things to a close. Thank you very much indeed for your questions and your participation. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Just a quick reminder to all our attendees that we will be sharing right after this webinar ends, you will see a survey on your screen. Um, if you have any questions for our presenters or our teams uh, about our products, about the topic, uh, just put them into the survey. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Um, have a nice day, everyone, and see you next time. Bye.